Hey guys, welcome to episode 130 of Stand Up with Pete Dominic. Joining me today, historian Kenneth C. Davis on Juneteenth and more, and comedian Christian Finnegan on the Week in News. I'm Pete Dominic. It is time to stand up with me right now. Hello, friends. Hello, family. You're like family to me, the people listening to this show. I love you. Thank you very much for your support, for signing up for a paid subscription. Over 615 of you now. Hope to see as many of you as I can tonight at 8 p.m. That is Friday, June 19th. Juneteenth! We'll celebrate Juneteenth at 8 p.m. If you are a paid subscriber, you'll get the link at patreon.com slash Pete Dominic. I hope to see you there. Going to have a great conversation with you. Going to see how... Things are going with the pandemic in your state. And speaking of which, it is on the rise in Florida, Texas, Arizona that have set new records for COVID-19 cases. The governors are not considering a shutdown of those states. Add South Carolina and Arkansas as the number of states, the states that are seeing the largest increase in cases over the last week. Uh, Dr. Scott Gottlieb, who used to work for Trump, uh, I think run his FDA, said some parts of the U.S. are on the cusp of losing control of the coronavirus. Dr. Anthony Fauci was uh, gave an interview to Sanjay Gupta on CNN where he said, unless players are essentially in a bubble, insulated from the community, they are tested nearly every day. It'd be very hard to see how football is able to be played this fall. So that created a lot of panic around America. We love our football. And is there going to be no football or baseball or basketball? He went on to say, if there's a second wave, which is certainly a possibility and which could be complicated by the predictable flu season, football may not happen this year. Nailing that Anthony Fauci impression. So 77 nations have seen a growth in new coronavirus cases over the past two weeks. Trump thinks the coronavirus testing is overrated. Also, the Trump administration apparently paid $7.3 million for more than 3 million test tubes, which is, I guess, fine, except for the test tubes that they got were made for bottling soda. They have no idea how to govern in this administration. Oh, 2 million, 187,876 Americans have contracted COVID-19, 118,381 have lost their lives, including my friend comedian Lori Kilmartin, whose mother just lost her fight with COVID-19. And Lori tweeted, live tweeted the death of her mother, as she did her father a few years ago. And it was humanizing and heartfelt and hilarious. I highly recommend you go follow her on Twitter at any Lori 16. So a lot more that I wanted to talk about. The other big news today, the really big story, the decision at the Supreme Court where they ruled five to four and Justice Roberts wrote the majority decision, which apparently is a big deal, that the Trump administration violated federal law when it ended the Obama era deferred action for childhood arrivals program, otherwise known as DACA. How about that? Another major decision, major win, I would argue, for progressives. And they are now upholding protections for deportation for roughly 649,000 unauthorized immigrants in the U.S. An unexpected victory for immigration activists. I'll talk to some next week. And in this opinion, Chief Justice John Roberts, who sided with the liberal justices, wrote that the Department of Homeland Security's decision to rescind DACA in the fall 2017 was arbitrary and capricious. Although some people are concerned that he's giving them Justice Roberts, that is a strategy, a blueprint for how they could get it right. All right. In other news, another 1.5 million people have applied for unemployment benefits last week. And now 74 percent of Americans say the country is heading in the wrong direction. Where is the other 26 percent of you, huh? Including 63 percent of Republicans, which is up from 42 percent in May, according to a new poll by the Associated Press. President Trump has always had strong approval ratings within the Republican Party, but the state of the country may be kind of eroding some of that support. And I think my theory is that the right wing media is beginning to abandon President Trump. The Drudge Report, Fox and Friends gave uh, Kaylee McEnany a hard time this morning. Uh, Sinclair's Eric Bowling gave the vice president, Mike Pence, a hard time this morning. Are we seeing the beginning of right wing media starting to abandon President Trump? Because 
I personally have always thought that the right wing media leads this president and covers for him and gives him all the reasons and excuses and support that he needs. And wherever they go, he goes and wherever he goes, the American public, a frighteningly large percentage, follow President Trump. So we'll see what happens. But I I feel like we're starting to see the beginning of the abandonment of some in the right wing media and starting to uh, actually be critical of this president. And I attribute that to his handling of the pandemic or not handling of the pandemic, his lack of sympathy for anybody dying and getting sick. And I apparently and I don't I, I don't know why this was a deal breaker, but a lot of Trump supporters who are also fairly religious and I don't have data on this, but I've just been hearing it really didn't like that. The president tear gassed and shot with rubber bullets. Peaceful protesters outside the White House so he could walk over to a church for a photo op. Apparently that was a an egregious action. I mean, we all I think everything this guy does is pretty horrible, but somehow that seemed to be a, a real problem for some. All right, a couple more stories before I get to my first guest, Christian Finnegan, today. And huge story and very important. Yesterday, Facebook took an ad down from the Trump campaign that went after Antifa and leftist groups with a prominent display of an inverted red triangle in a black outline, which is a symbol the Nazis used for political dissenters. Facebook has given politicians and campaigns wide latitude, according to Axios, and what they say on its platform, but this appears to have been a step too far. And, I mean, what do you think of this? This is a, is this not a major thing that the Trump administration used a Nazi symbol on Facebook? I mean, he doesn't care about putting humans in concentration camps. He tears children from their parents, and he uses Nazi symbols. He looks, smells, and acts like a Nazi, and the self-professed Nazis and white supremacists love him. I think the dude's a fucking Nazi. That's what I'm trying to tell you. And the famous quote from Maya Angelou, when people show you who they are, believe them. And here she is talking to Oprah about that. One of the most important lessons I ever learned from you. And I still am, you know, I think I know the lesson. And then I'll walk into a situation and think that's that same lesson. And that is when people show you who they are, believe them. Yes, absolutely. A person says to you, I'm selfish or I'm mean or I am unkind. Or I'm crazy. Or I'm cra- Believe them. They know themselves much better than you do. Mm-hmm. But no, more often than not, those of us who don't trust life say, don't say a thing like that. Mm-hmm. You're not really crazy. You're not really unkind. You're not really mean. <laughs> and as soon as you say that, the person pow, that you know and shows you, I told you. Mm-hmm. I told you I was unkind. So now why are you angry? Oh, that voice. Maya Angelou. Nailing it. Nailing it. Who do you think she was talking about? I don't think she was talking about Trump in that moment in that interview. That was years ago. But she's basically describing him, isn't she? Uh, And undercovered for today's podcast, I just want to mention these two stories. The uh, Environmental Protection Agency, who's supposed to protect the environment, announced yesterday it's going to stop regulating an additive in rocket fuel that is known to cause brain damage in infants. The EPA made the decision to reverse an Obama administration limit on percolate, percolate after a new analysis showed the toxic chemical is too rare in public water supplies to meet the legal test to set a federal limit. Hmm. That's, uh, I don't like that. I don't like that headline at all. And one more from the Washington Post. Senior State Department official who has served in the Trump administration since its first day it resigned yesterday over President Trump's recent handling of racial tensions across the country, saying that the president's actions, quote, cut sharply against my core values and convictions. Her name is Mary Elizabeth Taylor. She's an assistant secretary of state for legislative affairs, and she submitted her resignation on Thursday. Her five paragraph resignation letter obtained by The Washington Post served as an indictment of Trump's stewardship at a time of national unrest from one of the administration's highest ranking African-Americans and an aide who was viewed as a loyal and effective in serving his presidency. She's a black woman. She's assistant secretary of state, one of the highest ranking black women in his administration. She just resigned because she thinks Trump is uh, a racist. So, all right. 
It's a day, I think, 1,246 of our nightmare. There are 137 days, I believe, until the presidential election, give or take a day. I'm not sure if my numbers are up to date. But hang in there. I hope you're doing well. And I've got a great lineup of guests. Well, great two guests joining me today. Do you like three guests? Is, is three guests too much? Do you get time to listen to it? Are you listening in time and a half or or double speed, especially this opening part where I'm giving you some news and thoughts on things? Let me know. Let me know what you think. Yesterday's episode was a big hit. My parents uh, apparently uh, knocked it out of the park. We had a big, a great laugh at the beginning of yesterday's show. I was talking to my, my, with my parents about some new stuff. And then uh, they started making, long story short, they started making bird noises to each other. And uh, it really uh, apparently got a lot of laughs. I love hearing from people that were listening to yesterday's show talking about how much they liked it. Lots of great comments from listeners and subscribers over on the Patreon page. If you're not signed up yet, then what are you waiting for? Sign up for a paid subscription and join me tonight, 8 p.m. Eastern, June 19th. Get the link at patreon.com slash Pete Dominic, and I hope to see you tonight. Here now is my conversation with comedian Christian Finnegan, who's on Twitter, at Christ Finnegan. Buy all of his comedy specials. Let him know you heard him here and I didn't uh, get a chance to talk to him last Friday because I was driving last Thursday for a Friday show, but I caught up with him today. We had a great conversation recapping some of the week's news and more right now. Okay, I've got him now, and I am very sorry I did not have him, like I said, already out last week, but I was traveling on Thursday when pulling back the curtain. We generally sit down and tape this because I went up and visited my folks. Christian Finnegan is here today, though, and we're always happy when he is. Good to see you, pal. Thanks for joining me. Good to me. see you. How are your folks? They were great. It was good. It was a lot of fun. My dad said I would rather die of this horrible disease than spend another day not seeing the girls, my daughters, his granddaughters. And uh, my mom was like, you know what? I don't have to see him. But <laughs> so it was just your dad. It was. No, she she, of course, <laughs> they got tested. We got tested. We went up there. I'm just saying she was a little yeah. bit more concerned uh, about it all. But she was happy that we came and uh, I felt helpful. And they where had a good they, time. Where do they live? Upstate New York, where I grew up in the sticks outside Syracuse, oh, right. New York. Yeah. Yeah. It's lovely up there. Beautiful time of year. And it was great to see them. And they're doing good and uh, all, all good. So it's weird. It was the, you know, it's weird seeing people. Have you seen people? Loved yeah, ones? I actually, friends? I have a couple of friends coming over later this evening, actually. Exciting. Um, sit outside. Um, yeah. We have uh, taken in very temporarily a stray kitten. Um, my wife's business, we haven't been there as much and there's a backyard and there are a lot of stray cats in the story of Queens. If anyone has ever been there knows they're kind of known. And, uh, some cat gave birth in the backyard of QED. And, uh, one of the kittens we did not catch, but one of them, Cambry, my wife did. And, uh, so we have had a kitten for the past week, but, uh, we'll be handing it off to its forever home on, on, on Saturday. But uh, a couple of my friends who are cat fanatics are going to come by and squeal at the kitten tonight. Ah, uh, that's great. You should go live. <laughs> I've never gone live. Before. You haven't gone live. This is your opportunity to uh, broadcast the yeah. the introduction of the cat fanatics to the cats. I am yeah. caught up and do <laughs> kitten palooza. I, I do want to go back to uh, the only one she caught. I'm, I, you, well, because there were at least two. Uh, see, there are these pallets in the backyard and everything's overgrown because mm-hmm. it's summer. Mm-hmm. And so the mother had clearly given birth underneath these pallets. And so we were back two weeks ago and we saw them and I picked one of them up. But at the time I thought it was, I didn't really know when it's appropriate to take a kitten from its mother and it looked just too small. And I put it back down and then the next time we went back out there, they were gone. Uh, but then my wife went, went, was there a week later and one of the kittens at least was still there. And uh, so it seemed we, she talked to a vet and they said that it's best to take him at that point. And so uh, we've been giving him like eye medicine because he had like an eye infection and Ooh. just letting him, you know, but he's good. He's, you know, he's a little kid. Sounds like he's you little, adopted a set of bills. Well, not now. We're handing it off. This, uh, that's why. <laughs> Let's I, adopt that cat cha-ching. What is I'm this? I'm a huge fan of kittens, not that's, so much of cats. So. Oh, that's interesting. So have you seen, though, you're going to see these folks tonight, but have you seen others? Have you seen other loved ones, other friends? Have you socialized with anybody? Have you gotten near people in, in your space or theirs? These same people who are coming tonight, we have seen a couple of times. Okay. Uh, always outside, like we went on a hike one day, and we sat on their back porch one day. 
Um, but that's it. I'm in upstate New York right now. And so there's only a, a few, I only know like three people that live up here. And so I've seen those people and that's pretty much it. So we've seen a few, uh, we've been to a few. When I uh, went to marches, when I, I did a couple of oh, marches, obviously. Right. I, so, obviously you know, you've been marching. I, I went from seeing no one to seeing thousands of people. Well, that's different though, to, to the point of my question, which is the idea of when you do see people for the first time coming out of this pandemic and, and that interaction and what that's like. And, and I've come to the conclusion because I, I think now I've seen maybe uh, about a dozen people, phrase I never use. And I realized I miss touching them. I miss hugging people. And I even miss shaking hands, I think. But I miss, like, yeah. I usually will hug a man that I haven't seen for a little while uh, and yeah. or at all. I mean, I, I hug everybody and I miss it. I miss, I miss hugging. Yeah, I, I'm not a huge hugger, but I mean, I, I do hug friends of mine and I do think it is important. Will you hug these people? No, tonight, no. Well, you don't, well, you don't hug don't anybody. So. Right, you don't hug anybody. I, I should I'm say. Irish. I'm an Irish Catholic from Massachusetts. We're not a hugging culture, generally oh. speaking. Hmm. Um, but I do think that hugging is important, and I, I do miss, you know, luckily I'm married. You know, my friends who are single, some of them have had, like, literally no physical contact Brutal. since early March. That's Brutal. crazy. Yeah, I've done a, a, a couple of conversations here on the show about that with like single people. And it's 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 yeah, it's brutal. It's it's yeah. psychologically destructive for sure is the point I'm getting at. Not for me, but I, I just miss it. I just realized it today when I saw this guy, my friend Dan McDonald, who listens to the show, which is why I mentioned him. And I would have liked that. I would have hugged the guy. I would have hugged him. Yeah, but I didn't. it's going to be interesting. You know, a lot of people are saying that this will be like the death of the handshake that people yeah. won't go won't go back to shaking hands, which I mean, I'm okay uh, sure. with that. I don't miss handshakes. I suppose I guess I don't mind a handshake. I kind of, sometimes I kind of like a handshake with someone who not necessarily if I'm meeting them the first time, but it's like, if you have a business meeting or somebody who you're not like friends with, but you want to display some sort of vulnerability and warmth, I don't think it's bad to give a good handshake, but you know, is it important enough to, to get sick over? Certainly not. So let's talk about uh, some of the news uh, items. You sent some awesome articles that I read and I'm, I, I got to get to, but I do want to just ask you one thing that probably is not that most, uh, the most important issue, but on Sunday, I think it was Sunday, the president addressed the uh, graduating class at West Point. The controversy before the controversy was he should have never insisted on addressing them because they have to come back from wherever they live in the country mm -hmm. to West Point, which is North of New York city and uh, assemble in a, in a crowd, which is not smart. Uh, even though the, the numbers have gone way down here in New York. And so you saw them sitting there awkwardly 10 feet from the other guy. Point is, that was the first controversy. Uh, and we'll see. Hopefully no one gets sick as a result of that ceremony. But the president walking down the ramp gingerly and even more uh, strangely, not being able to get a glass up to his mouth has, has created a lot of suspicion amongst uh, credible reporters that that emergency visit back in November to Walter Reed might have been something a little bit more serious. What do you have any thoughts on this? And should we not be talking about it at all? Uh, well, I, I, have can we make another... fun of him at least a little bit and then move I'm on? Sorry? to something? I mean, can we at least make fun or should we not even be doing that? <laughs> I don't have a problem making fun of him, but I, I had a slightly different take, or at least as a possibility that I think Trump is deathly afraid of spilling down hit the front of his shirt. I think he's so worried about looking like a buffoon. I think that he, it's possible that he may have taught himself a long time ago to never tilt his head back when he drinks, because I think he leans forward slightly. And so he moves the glass up with both hands so that if it does drip, it's not going to drip down the front of his tie. I, I, I think that that is a very Trumpy sort of thing it that he is, probably has been doing for 20 years. Yes, it's except. It, it, except it contrasts with the it's not consistent with the rest of his personality. He doesn't want to have anything on his tie, a stain, any 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 water because he doesn't want to look like a fool uh, or whatever. Well, and same reason anybody wouldn't want to stain on their tie, I suppose. But he also doesn't want to look weak. And yeah. he doesn't obviously define strength the way that most humans, at least educated, civilized ones do. But he looks pretty weak when he can't get that glass of water up to his mouth. That looks yeah, weak see, to me. I I think that he is deathly afraid of looking like a slob, you know, in, in his mind that I, I just think right. that he doesn't want to be ridiculed and he doesn't realize that drinking water like that actually makes him look well, even more foolish okay, than just, if he were spilling himself. But. Again, I don't know if I'm pushing back on your theory or not, but I do have to ask you if he does, if he's afraid of the way that he is going to look, then don't we have to start all the way back at the first time you and I 
or anybody else ever laid eyes on that man and thought, oh, what's what's wrong with his face and with his hair? Yeah, like, what's I, wrong I, with his face and hair? I don't know. I mean, I, I can't give you a viable answer. I just I think there could be other things other than health afflictions for why he drinks like that, because he's done it since the debates. I mean, you know, you'd see him have one of those tiny little bottles of water and he would use both hands to to drink from it, you know. So, I mean, maybe he, you know, I've heard people throw around, you know, possibly irresponsibly throw around things like Parkinson's and stroke. And, I heard you know, stroke and things. like. I mean, that's it's entirely possible. It might be that he can't <clears throat> fully like tilt his head back. Like there could be some neck back type thing that I, I don't know what it is. Do you but, think it would be unfair for a journalist to say, sir, could we see you drink a glass of water with your right hand? <laughs> Not in my mind, but uh I think that probably it the story would be uh, – it, it would do more damage to journalistic credibility than whatever his response All right, how about this? Because- Can, uh, one push-up, please. Joe Biden just did 10. Oh, God. Yeah, absolutely. Joe yeah. Biden just did 10 push-ups. Could we see I mean, you do one, please? push-ups. Point to Idaho on a map. Tell us what Juneteenth is. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Point exactly. to – Tell us, uh, tell us the first five amendments in order. Tell us. I promise you, he wouldn't get past number two. Name all of your children. <laughs> my, it's my favorite. Uh, you've seen broadcast news. Have you seen? Uh, I feel like you have mentioned this to it me before, and I had to, to say, to, "Go ahead." I, mean, I guess this weekend, I'm, I'm now been shamed into having to watch it's, it this weekend. Re- it's really a fantastic, fantastic movie, and I recommend it without reservation. Right. But there's a great scene where Albert Brooks plays a journalist who's kind of smart and diligent, but not very charismatic, and William Hurt plays a guy who's sort of like got Anchorman written all over him, but he's a bit of a dope, a nice guy, but a dope, and. Albert Brooks is basically trying to make him feel like an idiot. He's like, can you name all the Supreme Court justices? And William Hurt's like, no, nah, you're not going to, I'm not going to do that. Of course I can, but I'm not going to do that to please you. And he's like, uh, and he's like, all 12? And he's like, yes, Aaron, I can name yes. all 12. And he's like, great. There's only nine. That's great. That's <laughs> great. great. Yeah. Well, it reminds me of uh, that moment with uh, uh, Mark uh, Halpern, Rip, rest in peace. And John Howman asked him uh, <laughs> about his favorite like Bible passages. That was yeah. the great, probably my favorite of all moments that he had during the campaign. But, the, but again, though, they, they let it go. They wouldn't drill it further. Yeah, they, they probably let, should have. That silly, ridiculous answer. Well, know? that's because Halpern had to go assault a woman. He was busy. He was <laughs> he, late. He was for, that's not fair, Pete. He's, yes. he's in recovery. That Cialis isn't going to last forever. You know, he'd already ah, taken He had a way to run out of there so he could go. Soft. He's, yeah. Oh, that was the weirdest of all of them, I think, you know, in a weird way. Um, all right. So I also want to talk with you about this other story from this week that he's gotten a lot of attention. Uh, and that is the, that the police, uh, police officers around the country are, are concerned that they are that, that they are being messed with at fast food restaurants in particular. A video on Twitter is over a million views now of a police officer who's crying while telling viewers that she was made to wait for a McDonald's meal after ordering a head. And then. In New York earlier this week, uh, three NYPD officers went to the hospital after consuming milkshakes from Shake Shack, which they said contained suspicious substances. Turns out, after an investigation by their employer, the NYPD, uh, the found no incident of criminality. Christian, of course, Shake Shack's employees instead discovered the cleaning solution hadn't been thoroughly rinsed from a milkshake machine. So it was anybody probably who got a shake from that cursed yeah. machine these two stories what do they what do they tell us how how do you hear them I mean, it's not even just these two stories i mean if you remember i think it was last year where the the cop said that at starbucks they he didn't get ketchup paid. when he ordered his fries <laughs> no no you remember there's a dude at starbucks a cop at starbucks who said that the uh the people at starbucks had written pig on his sheet you know like when you, you get a little slip it has your name on it yep and some girl like almost got fired over it. And then it found out that he had done it himself. Like, cause you can, if you're doing a to go order, you can put in the name oh, of the order. Man. And you know, some, I don't necessarily know that these Shake Shack guys were flat out just lying. Probably not. You know, I'm, I get they, they are on a hair trigger, but just the, the, the cops, not, you said the Shake Shack guys, which made it I'm sound sorry, like the, the employees. The, yes, yeah. Yes, yes. The forever, forever known as the Shake Shack cops. Shake Shack cops. Yeah. 
I mean, it's just, it's so absurd and it's so classic. I mean, if you didn't feel like the police force writ large was a bit sketchy before all of this, you, you have to now. When you see the silly little grifts and tricks that they're pulling, I mean, not just to get sympathy, like the woman at the at the McDonald's drive through who, you know, who's who says who's begging people. Uh, uh, not enough people are saying thank you to me anymore. That was that was one of the things she said. It's like, first of all, fuck you. You know, I don't know if, if you've ever seen the show Mad Men, but there's a great line where, where one of the where Elizabeth Moss says to uh, John Hamm, like, gets mad at him for taking credit for her idea. And he just screams at her. That's what the money is for. You know, you, these idea that these police officers have to be just stroked and just fellated on a day-to-day basis. Oh, you're such a wonderful human being. Yes, it can be a dangerous job. That's why you have an incredibly generous pension. That's why you have overtime. Like you are the most protected workforce in the United States of America. And so I just don't agree with this idea that we have to constantly be, you know, telling them how appreciative we are. And at the beginning of that video, the, the Egg McMuffin cop lady, she said, uh, she made a big point of saying, I always order in advance because otherwise people pay for my meal. Right. So, so, so they need to do that. And thank you. Is that the idea? <laughs> like how much gratitude does this lady need? But the, you know, they, it just, it, it enrages me and this, this, I, this entitled class, uh, you know, of, of police officers, they, they feel like the world owes them on a day-to-day basis. And, you know, no one forced you to become a police officer. No one forced you. And you, you can gotta, stop anytime you, you want. You, yes. you can't stop being a woman. You can't stop being gay. You get a pension and you after can't... 20 years. What right. other job do you get a lifetime pension after working 20 years? Uh, a lot of government jobs you do, but they're, okay. yeah, but, but they're government jobs and they're often frowned upon unless, of course, you're a firefighter or a police department. And, and, and the, the government job or institution that had the best approval ratings, Christian, uh, federal government job is the, do you know what it is? Do you want to guess? Like, I have no idea. Um, the United States post office. Yeah. Is my and understanding. I may have that wrong. Do. Right. And they're going to run them out of business. Yeah. And I, apparently it's the, uh, the single largest employer of, uh, black people in the United States of America. And so of course, you know, you, you hear the post office used all the time as a as a punching bag. Right. You know, what privatize it. Pretty, it's pretty great. It's not bad. It's really you know, they have this doomsday scenario. They, they always use the DMV as well. It's like, you know, this is what liberal government is. Have you been to the DMV lately? You've been to the post office lately. I remember Megan McCain last year complaining like uh, so the whole government. Have you have you been to the post office lately? Like Megan McCain has stepped foot in a post office in the past ever. Much less the DMV. Know, like, By the way, uh, there in line with her mail, you know, for a letter to her grandmammy. No, a letter not. to White Santa. Uh, yeah. Top ten most dangerous jobs in America. Uh, first line supervisors of landscaping, lawn service, and groundskeeping workers. Uh, first line supervisor construction trades, extraction workers, structural iron and steel workers is number eight. Farmers, ranchers, and other agricultural workers number seven. Six is drivers. Sales workers, truck drivers. Five is uh, like sanitation collectors. Uh, Four, roofers. Number four, most dangerous job. Three, aircraft pilots and flight engineers. Two, fishers and related fishing workers. People who are professional fishing industries. Number one, logging workers. We don't celebrate any of those people. Yeah. And if one of them dies, they do not get a horse-drawn carriage and a five-gun salute. And probably they don't get a huge benefit death benefit for the family when a black person dies they get nothing that's why the phrase Mm -hmm. black lives matter exists and that's why the phrase blue lives matter or all lives matter doesn't make any sense not the point yeah what i'm talking preaching the enlightened well i know what i'm trying to say is loggers lives matter too i mean number (laughs) one jesus logging workers wow well and just the fact that you're equating a job with an actual physical circumstance of existence thank you thank you for your sensitivity on that i missed that yes yeah yeah being black isn't a job yeah and being a cop is a job and but i was i think i was talking about you know dangerous jobs but but, you know it's yeah we're talking about it's dangerous to be in black skin in america and that's what it's it's not that hard to understand given the statistics and 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 now that we are all seeing 
Some well, of these and images. I was saying for it, you know, you see these little pranks, or I don't know if the grift is the right word, but you know, in Atlanta right now, a lot of the cops are not responding to nine one one calls, or they're not responding to backup calls. They're sort of trying to slow walk as sort of a punishment to the mayor for uh, pressing charges against the guys who uh, killed Rayshard Brooks. It, 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 you, I'm sure you saw that footage last week of the protester walking and the police officer deliberately stopping in front of him so he'd bump into him. Yeah, so where that was that? other police officers can start beating the crap out of yeah, him. Yeah, it was horrible. You, you horrible. see these dumb little plays that they run. It's, it's, and this is the, when they know that they're being filmed. So they, they, you know that saying, when, when all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail? Yeah, I've heard that a lot in reference to these guys. Yeah. Yeah. They yeah. don't know how else to Well, be. that's because of what I've learned is the culture in law enforcement in America is very militaristic. I mean, I knew the uniforms and the equipment, but I didn't realize they thought they were in a war against their neighbors. And that they wear fucking Punisher patches yeah. and skull patches and shit like You're a cop. You don't, you yeah, don't show up. You, you don't get sh- to feeling like a superhero in their minds. By the way, in the military, don't wear a fucking skull either. Don't. Yeah. It's terrible messaging. It's terrible. You don't want to show up anywhere that there's a child and you want to be seen as a helper and you have a skull and you're the punisher. It's nonsense. Mm-hmm. And it's and it's it's horrible. And I, I, I'm glad that you you got me fired up. Well, uh, and that's what's so frustrating is that, you know, you see there's a lot, of, you know. When you see a police force in a in a major American city. It's comprised, generally speaking, of two groups of people, Uh, people of color who need the benefits and job, you know, black, Latino, Asian sort of. But they seem like normal and not overly aggressive. They seem like regular people. And then you see the white dudes with just rage boners. And that seems to be the police force and like a combination of those two groups in in every single city. Somebody had referred to them as white tryhards, which uh, is kind of perfect but you you well that- I, I i don't think i've heard rage boner and that's pretty perfect it really is <laughs> yeah. because what if you were to, uh, un- we went to high school we know the kind of guys who wanted to be cops who grew up to be cops yes all of them they were the kind of guys who also said let's go out and fight tonight yeah let's yeah. go get in a fight let's look for a fight let's start a fight no yes. you're th- you're supposed to stop the fight. You're supposed to de-escalate. And that takes me to another article that you sent me, which, Christian, this Washington Post article uh, is I almost want to read the entire thing on the air because it's filled with statistics. And basically it, it goes to what you're just saying about you were breaking it down law enforcement by race and ethnicity and the difference between a lot of the white guys and Hispanic and blacks and Asians. But. If we divide it on gender terms, something different happens. This article that you sent me, and I'll link to it in the show notes and tweet about it. It's so good by Rosa Brooks, who's a professor at Georgetown Law Center in the Washington Post. It's titled One Reason for Police Violence, Too Many Men with Badges. The statistics in this article are mind blowing about how much lower incidents of violence, shootings, and then lawsuits against women, female yeah. police officers are versus ma- male police officers. It is unbelievable. And the point they're saying is how, to, to de-escalate violence, to have less violence uh, from police, hire more women. It's not going to solve nearly any, you know, all the problems, but it would be one way to go. So I'm so yeah, glad I, you sent this to me and I don't know what you want to say about it. And sorry for talking for so long, but I just want to oh, no. set it up. No, I, I agree. And, you know, it wouldn't solve every problem. I'm not trying to say that, that women aren't as corrupt as men or they might not be as, I don't, who knows whether there is, you know, if they're any more or less honest. But I can tell you that generally speaking, they're slower to violence. They're, you know, and that's, that's just, that's the reality that we all live in. <laughs> that, that-, that if you have two women cops, the chances of it breaking into violence are just far less. Far less. Decades of research. It's arguable. Decades of research show female officers can handle hostile and violent suspects as well as their male counterparts. Because, and that's an important point, important point to make because we think, what well, uh, these are big guys. They're in a fight. We better send the guy cop in because the woman cop is weaker and, and can't handle it. No, a woman can handle it. Clearly, there's the research. A 2017 Pew study, however, found 
only 11% of female officers reported they'd ever fired their weapon while on duty compared to 30% of male officers. Female officers were also less likely to believe in aggression and more useful than uh, is more useful than courtesy. Less likely to agree. Some people, quote, can only be brought to reason the hard physical way and less likely to report their jobs had made them callous. And there is so much more in this article. uh, And it's the research is resounding uh, about the gender issue and how much more peaceful and effective female police officers than male police officers are. And I'll be clear about one thing. Like I'm not, I'm a man. I'm a straight dude who's had relationships with women. I'm not going to say that I don't have issues with, with women, you know, that, that I don't have, I'm not, I'm not one of these guys who's just like, Oh, women should run everything. Like I, women have their own flaws, just like men have. I mean, we all have human flaws, but then there are certain flaws that are tend to be more male and certain flaws that maybe tend to be more female or whatever. I'm not trying to be quote unquote, Mr. Soy boy, you know, as, as some idiots would say, I'm just saying, use, use your brain. I mean, you have experienced life. I'm I'm not really making a lot of sense here. Well, I, I have I have, ex- have something to, <laughs> to, to please no, edit this out. Well, no, <laughs> no. I'm glad you I said just, that I, way because I was worried myself that you're somehow virtual signaling every time we're talking about these gender differences yeah. and it's men talking about women. But it, but I like to say this. I know a lot of women that are assholes that I really don't like. I know a lot of black people that are assholes that I really don't like. But it's not because they're women or it's not because of the color of skin. I just don't like these individual people. Then again, if we're going to generalize, we generalize about women. We say, especially in the workplace, we're concerned that they might be too emotional. The problem, though, is that we use the word emotional to re- reference uh, empathy and crying and, and, and things like that. Yeah, as, as opposed to the shit out of you isn't emotional. Yes. <laughs> Anger is the equal emotion to happy as it is to sad. They're all equal emotions. So if you're really angry, you're really an emotional person. If you're often angry. If you often and, cry, you're really emotional. You know, I mean, it, it, of course, it's, you can find all sorts of anecdotal evidence. You know, well, this look at this female cop. She, you know, stood there while somebody was getting his ass kicked or somebody was murdered or that that police officer who entered that dude's apartment last year. Uh, uh, the woman who yeah, went in the wrong apartment, shot a black guy while he's sitting yeah. in his own apartment eating ice cream. Yeah, it's horrible. And so, you know, it's not as if police malfeasance would just disappear off the face of the planet. But you can't tell me it wouldn't go down. I mean, you can't honestly look me in the face and tell me that if the police force was, say, 55 percent women, 45 percent men, that this would be less of a problem. Of course it would. Of course it would. It'd be it'd be absurd to suggest otherwise. Yeah. Well, I mean, I'll, I will make the generalization that that men are more likely to be attracted to and to create conflict, uh, physical conflict than women are. I'm going to go yes. ahead and say it. And we can talk about why that might be. And we can talk about it if it's more likely in our country as opposed to another nation or a different culture. But a lot of a lot of men, especially men who are used to handling things physically, they've never learned the skills of handling things any other way. Kind of like that joke that a lot of male comics will say about like women who've never had to buy their own drinks before. You know, it, it, well, men are the same way. They've never had to solve a problem before because they're, you know, they can kick ass. You know, and so they've never had to sort of reason through. And so they're incapable of de-escalating a situation because they've never done it in their own personal lives. Yeah. If things get too tense, if things get too heated, fists come out. That's just how things are handled. So you, then we put them out in the street with a gun and we expect them to all of a sudden acquire all sorts of other, you know, emotional intelligence skills that they've never displayed in their own personal lives. <laughs> well, that's why we should teach conflict resolution in elementary school. I mean, I'm serious, you know, mindfulness and conflict resolution and things like that uh, should be things that you, you teach as part of curriculum. Have you, Christian Finnegan, ever been in a fist fight? Not since I was like a kid, you know, um, when it didn't count as much. Not really. I was goaded and I was sort of the the kind of slightly larger fat kid. And I, I was a fat kid who cried a lot. And so I was a really sweet proving ground for any kid with a Napoleon complex. How, so did you get beaten up a lot? No, I actually didn't get beaten up. I I never really would get into the fights. I would start crying before the fight even started. But I did go sort of Ralphie from Christmas Story a couple times. And, uh, 
you know, I would be in tears just swinging my fists. And I actually did. I remember once the entire neighborhood had gathered around to try to get me and this kid to fight. I feel like I may have mentioned this story to you. It's a uh-uh, very I don't think so. boy type situation. And they were goading us into fighting, goading, goading, goading us into fighting. And I was crying. And so finally I just lashed out and I started swinging my fists and I punched this kid and his braces went up into his gum. And he started screaming like, ah, oh, my braces, my braces. And I stopped because, and everybody started making fun of him because he was, wasn't fighting back. And I started defending the kid. I was like, his braces are in his gum. Like, give him a minute, give him a minute. And everybody made fun of him and they left. And then he and I went and rode bikes. That's a sweet story. It's a very boy story. You know, it's a very. You I know. had a kid who I came up with. We were really good friends in third grade, had a few play dates, but definitely had an affinity for each other. Uh, and we grew apart and he uh, grew into kind of that, that kid. He's a tough kid. He's a tough kid. Nobody messed with this kid. And he was kind of a bully, but he's still a sweetheart at, 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 at heart. He had a lot of shit going on at home. That's for sure. I knew that. And. At some point after practice, he hung me up on a hook by my underwear, like wedgie first and then put me right up on the hook in front of my friends. It yeah. was humiliating and painful. And I like then I ripped off. It fell off, whatever. It, you know, didn't do permanent physical damage or anything like it, it wasn't that bad, but it was real humiliating. Sure. I was a tiny kid, so I was a real target for like lifting and putting up and, and, and beating up. Um, and I was usually I usually didn't have problems, but. That kid called me that afternoon and apologized. He felt so horrible for what he had done. Like, I think the image of me hanging by my underwear on a hook was so brutal (laughs) for everybody that he like he had he had a lot of empathy and he just didn't know how to deal with his anger. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of what we were saying. But his call, well, I'll never forget him him making that call and apologizing meant everything to me. At that point, we were probably in like seventh grade by that point. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, a lot of kids who grow up physically larger than other kids in that's how they're taught, whether in, you know, uh, directly taught or just by observation to handle situations. And And if it gets too tense, then beat beat the shit out of somebody. And uh, the same kid in a game of uh, dodgeball and gym. What'd you call it? Battle ball, dodgeball. Uh, Kid threw the ball and hit him in the face. Mm-hmm. And he was like humiliated that he got hit in the face or mad they get hit in the face. Not like the kid was aiming for it. It's battle ball. It's dodgeball. Yeah. Get hit. Walks across the gym, across the perimeter, just punches that kid right in the face. I'll never forget it. It was just like it didn't escalate. He gets hit by the by the ball in the face and he just walks across and just smashes his fist in the other kid's face. And the old gym teacher was like a World War II veteran. He was so old. I'll never get Christian. His reaction was, okay, that's enough. <laughs> that was it well, clearly <laughs> clearly that's enough i want to talk to you about one more issue today which was you're a big like entertainment like guy, like you're good at talking about tv film and music you're really good at talking about arts performing arts i love to hear you talk about it i can't talk about it but i am interested in this issue that you're pointing to and i don't know if this is your phrase or not if it isn't it's great an entertainment desert what is this what are your what is your concern here what's happening well you know Nothing's been in production for the past few months. Really? Nothing? Like no TV? No, nothing? I mean, not that I know of. I mean, I haven't heard anything, but other than the sort of Zoom based shit that they're trying to put on the air, you know, those weird shows where, you know, live from somebody's apartment. It's like, hey, there's John Legend in his garage or whatever. Um, But (laughs) that didn't really affect us at first because all the stuff they were filming in 2019 was kind of in the kiln, you know, it was sort of in right. the chamber. Right. But now we're, j- we're going to start running out of new stuff and it's going to be very interesting. I mean, there's so much to watch, so it's not like we're not going to have anything, but there is this sort of steady churn of like, have you seen this new show? Have you seen, you know, have you heard that new album? I mean, music isn't quite as affected because you can make albums. A lot of bands have already made albums. Is that right? I, I don't know anything about music. Uh, I don't follow yeah, it. So there's, have- a band called, there's a band called White Denim that put out an album that was entirely recorded during the quarantine. Um, there's a, a few artists who have done that, especially if you're just like a singer-songwriter type. It's a little easier. But there's a, a number of artists who have recorded during the, during the, the lockdown. But, you know, you can't film a movie. You can't do a TV show. You know, there's... 
hundreds or thousands of people working on these projects. And so you're going to see a lot of garbage that was a, you know, would have gone straight to video back in the eighties, but that has just been sort of sitting on someone's hard drive at Warner brothers for the past two years, because I haven't known what to do with it. You're going to see a bunch of movies starring stars that were shot in 2017, these movies you've never heard of. And then you're going to see them and you're going to find out why. Um, but there's going to, you know, it's going to be a real, because they're that bad that they, they didn't release them, but they have yeah, them in yeah. the can. So why not? Yeah. And also a lot of, a lot of movies at least are pushing back the releases, even movies that are done because they don't want to put them out right now because nobody can go to the theaters to see them. Like Christopher Nolan, uh, his new movie, Tenant, the guy who did, you know, Inception and the Batman movies and, yep, yep. and, uh, his, movies I thought that was about what I thought that was going to be uh, about, uh, C- Former CIA head George Tennant. That's what I thought George it was about. Tenet. But it's not very grim about tale. Uh, <laughs> White Denim. This is from their new album that you just mentioned, World as a Waiting Room. Yeah. No, that's not them. That's definitely not White Denim. <laughs> this. Yeah, that sounds like them. I think what just happened was my wife has using Spotify with a client. And I think I played her music that she had with her client and then I stole it. And then her client just heard white denim, just like my audience. There you go. There you go. Sorry. I'm going to be in trouble. Really getting a real peek behind the curtain. Uh, Yeah. There's only one Spotify account. (laughs) It's an interesting uh, issue and problem. And I just don't think that there's going to be a real solution to at least movies, but I also don't understand why the economics of filmmaking hasn't just completely gone straight to on demand is it still well, not every that movie, like something like like uh christopher nolan they're visual extravaganzas okay but what percentage of new films are visual extravaganzas? i mean why can't a rom-com come straight out to well, video because uh, to de- well, those on- already are see the way that the, the way that the film industry has moved in the past 15 years or so is that the only movies that are in theaters are basically, first of all, because they have to play all over the world. They have to play in China. They have to play, you know, in the, you know, in, in India. They have to be big. And so they tend to be more fast and furious, sort of big effects extra, extravaganzas, the ones that actually play in the theaters now. You don't see when Harry met Sally's so much in the theater. Those generally go straight to Netflix or whatever. Um, and so a lot of these directors is like, well, we're not going to put out our $200 million Jason Statham in the rock, you know, effects epic out in theaters when, you know, on, on, so people can watch it on their iPhone. I mean, some, some are doing that, but you look at uh, Judd Apatow's new movie, the one with Pete Davidson. Yeah. Is it good? You know, I have no idea. Nobody's seeing it. Nobody's what? Wa- I mean, oh, is sure it, why are. is it? It's already on demand. He, he, that's a movie that he would have put in the theaters because Judd Apatow has enough of a track record that that would have had. Right. So what's, run. so what are you saying? What does that prove or not prove? Uh, to me, it proves that the idea that you can just dump it on demand, you know, there's, it's not economically viable for a film studio. You know, I guarantee you whatever they're pulling in for uh, King of Staten Island, which I believe is the name of the yeah. Pete Davidson movie it's not what they would have pulled in if it had been released in theaters. And so the economics so still uh, questions like, should we just hold on to this until 2021 right. when people can go back to theaters? But at that point there's going to be, we're going to go from no movies to see to the theaters just being jam packed with blockbusters, which, you know, maybe is a good thing if you're looking for nice fun spring 2021 movie viewing, but well, have you watched Chris Hemsworth's, Netflix movie Extraction. Of course not. I mean, I don't mean to say it, like nothing against him, but it's just like that's a perfect example. It's like it just joins the pile. It, you know, you're... I fucking loved it. Oh, really? It and I don't like those movies uh, like the John Wick ones where they're almost like a video game where you're just blowing people away. I don't like that kind of movie. I don't mind violence, but I don't like that kind of gratuity. Just one guy killing like hundreds of people. I but like I it. do like Chris Hemsworth way too much. Like a lot. I like him a lot. I know that feeling. I have my, my wife accused me of uh having a crush on George Clooney because I I just genuinely like that guy. I, I same like, too, but I, I mean like, like him. Yeah. my my 
I like watching Clooney, but my physical kind of attraction, it's not, I don't think it's sexual. I, I admire his torso and his face. Like, I think he's so beautiful and his body is so uh, perfect that I, 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 I am, a, I'm a total sucker for some of that, sh- that, that masculine male kind of, I don't know. Well, action stuff when you find out that they're like nice dudes yeah i met him too once briefly and he was really nice and i and very funny and yeah so that matters too but i never met oh no i did meet Clooney. val we sat next to him at the white house correspondence dinner right next to him and he was the you know probably always the biggest guy in the room but so he was mobbed all night and val finally my wife um bothers him for a picture and we have this picture of her with george Clooney, but he has his hand on his like breast pocket almost. And I, I, I to this day, just be skeptical that he takes so many pictures with people. He just doesn't want to get his wallet or whatever stolen. <laughs> I don't well, know why else. Maybe that's his thing, but, and by the way, and I've probably told this before and it's really hacky, but I did think we were at a hotel. I just introduced my wife to Michelle Obama and George Clooney sex for me tonight. And I'll just never forget. She's like, I'm too tired. I'm like, we're at a hotel. I just met you. I just introduced you to Clooney. He's like, sorry. I'm like, I. D-. Well, it's no offense, but it's a steep drop. Well, no doubt. But yeah. I, I mean, if what do I have to do? Could have put such a little a, Clooney mask on. Just such a funny thing. Play I mean, Steven Soderbergh sort of Ocean's Eleven music in the background. Turn the lights <laughs> down low. <laughs> Does this change anything? Yeah. When I when I used to work on. Um, oh, two things. Uh, there was actually a George Clooney anecdote that I thought was really useful is that his way of getting people to leave him alone without being rude is that when somebody comes up and wants to like invade his personal space, he'll put his face even closer to them, like almost abruptly like like, shake their hands and pull them in super close. Like, Hey, nice to meet you and get right. Like nose, nose with them and people instinctively then back off. That works. It's awkward. Oh, that that then gives him the opening to then be like, nice to meet you. See you later. Oh, that's, (laughs) I would love to see that social experiment. That's interesting. What's the other one? Oh, the, well, the other one was just a, a personal anecdote. When I used to work on the show, are we there yet? Um, you know, at a certain point, Terry Crews was the lead on that show and his star had sort of begun to rise and Ice Cube was on the show occasionally. And so he would be at the studio and it was just shot in Connecticut in Stanford, Connecticut. And so at a certain point, you know, we had parking spots and they didn't, they wanted us to come up with fake names just so that people wouldn't know where Terry Crews's parking spot was or whatever. And so everyone made up their silly little name and mine was a uh, Jorge Clooney. It was a J O R G E K L O O N E Y. Just because I just thought it'd be hilarious if George Clooney's fake name was still George Clooney. <laughs> That's hilarious. And I'm looking it up right Clooney now. Hilarious is overstating. Well, it, maybe. Please. But I do. I suit, <laughs> I'm reading about it now. Wikipedia says Terry Crews changed his parking spot name uh, to Christian Finnegan. So nobody would bother him. Yeah, That's messed up. Clearly works for him. That's messed up. <laughs> No, nobody's waiting at his parking spot to say like I had sex with Katie too. Or <laughs> <laughs> All right, dude, I'll let you go. I love it. I love talking to you. Thank you so much for joining me. It is, uh, we missed you last week. It's great to have you back and uh, Thanks, I hope dude. you have a great week and I'll talk to you soon. Indeed. See you later, Pete. He's always great. I always love talking to Christian Finnegan. I hope you will reach out to him and tell him you enjoy hearing him on the podcast. He joins me almost every Friday. Who else would you like to hear regularly uh, every week? I got to I got to try to hand these slots out more permanently. It's it's it makes it easier to schedule the show. But uh, and there's a lot of great people. And, you know, it's it's scheduling can be a, a challenge. But let me know who else would you like to hear every week at a certain a certain day? I'm always relying on you the listener and especially the subscriber if you're a paid subscriber you're a producer of this show as well and i take seriously all of your suggestions and ideas so who are the other folks that you would really like to hear each and every week on the show all right speaking of one of your all-time favorites we like to talk history i think history is always an important issue and now more than ever the president uh, is taking credit for juneteenth he just found out about it he often does that he finds out about things and then thinks that nobody else uh, has ever heard about him because that's what narcissism does. It it really it can poison your soul to the point you think that if you, if you don't know something, then nobody can know something. If you haven't experienced something, then nobody's experienced something. That's our president, and he does uh, does not think anybody knew about Juneteenth until he learned about it this week. We well, you know who did know about it and has been talking about it and writing about it for years. My next guest. 
Professor, as I always call him, Kenneth C. Davis is a great historian, my favorite. Don't know much.com is his website. You should get all of his books. You should just go buy all of his books and have them on his bookcase. You want a summer reading book? Get all of his books. They're so fun to read. They're great. He's got kids' books, and I always love when he joins us. And I got to say, this is one of my favorite conversations I think I've ever had with Kenneth C. Davis. And we went almost an hour, and it was great. We covered a lot of ground. Always love talking to him. I hope you enjoy it too. There he is, ladies and gentlemen, the greatest historian known to man. My favorite historian, at least, I'll say. Kenneth C. Davis is joining me, and uh, I've just told them all about your books and your work. And I appreciate you joining me for another lesson today, sir. But as right before I pressed record, you said it's always great to uh, get a perspective. And as a historian, to be able to look back at, at, at what has gone on fairly recently and put it into perspective. What are you referring to? What are you talking about? Why does that matter? Um, good morning, Pete, and, and thanks for having me. It's, a, it's an important moment, I think, because it's it truly is a historic moment. We only get a few chances, even though we live through history all the time, I think there are only a few moments, at least in my lifetime, where I felt the enormity of history around me. You know, in 1968, I was a fairly young man. I was a kid. I was a teenager. I was 14 in 1968. But it was really the point at which I would say I became politically aware. Um, It was this extraordinary moment in history where so much was happening Vietnam, the Tet Offensive, the withdrawal of Lyndon B. Johnson, the assassination of Martin Luther King, followed very shortly after that by the assassination of Robert F. Kennedy, and then, of course, the tumultuous Democratic Convention in Chicago. So I knew that I was living and watching history in an extraordinary way. Um, I feel very much the same way right now. Hmm. Um, in, in similar ways, because we are undergoing a radical transformation of aspects of our society that we haven't seen like this in a very, very long time. I feel like you're referring to the pandemic and Black Lives Matter movement. Is there? I am referring to the, the pandemic and Black Lives Matter movement, but nothing can be separated. So right. everything... Everything all comes together and it all fits together because history doesn't happen in, uh, in, in, in different spots. It always is happening and interacting with itself. Just as in 1918, uh, and we've talked about the Spanish flu, you couldn't talk about the Spanish flu without talking about World War I, and you couldn't talk about World War I without talking about the Spanish flu and the impact of those two things on society. So sometimes we tend to look at history and we think, oh, this thing happened on one day and that thing happened on another day. But of course, all these things are always interrelated and knit together. So here we are on this rather momentous day in American history called Juneteenth. And we'll come back to that, I'm sure. Um, it, and everything is changing around us. Uh, certainly, we are still in the midst of a pandemic crisis, even though people at the uh, top levels of government, both nationally and in some states, are trying to pretend we are not in the midst of a crisis and that uh, the warmer weather is here and it's going away. It is not. Um, Cases are rising in something like 20 uh, states, including some of the largest states, including the state to which the president will have uh, will travel this weekend for a rally. Uh, Oklahoma has is now having record increases in cases. And we are told, of course, that that's not Uh, that things are going down there. And just to connect, uh, just to connect two things that you said, I read a statistic this morning because you mentioned obviously 1918, which you wrote a really great book uh, about the pandemic of 1918, uh, deadlier than war, of course. And I read a statistic this morning, sir, that said more Americans have died of COVID-19 than died in World War One. Does that sound right? 
Yes, that's, that is correct right now. Now, many more Americans died of the Spanish flu in 1918 and 1919 than died in World War I, also 675,000. Uh, the uh, losses in World War I were a little over 100,000, so we've already uh, well, well passed that. And that 100,000 number actually also includes some men who died of uh, a, a Spanish flu, because it was a major killer of soldiers and sailors. Um, so that's why you can never disconnect uh, these these dis- different things in history, which is the way we tend to teach history when we teach it at all, which is you know problematic. We always have yeah. to see things in in connection. That thing ne- things never happen in a vacuum. So uh, just to go back to the original question of why it feels uh, very historic, I was reflecting certainly earlier in the week uh, uh, with the idea that it's only in 2015, five years ago, that we got the Supreme Court decision that permitted same-sex marriage nationwide. It's just five years ago. It seems like a, a lifetime ago that that decision was made. Think how... You take that five years from then to the five years of uh, the decision that was made this week, which broadened uh, rights for um, uh, gays and transgendered people in this country. And that's an astonishing leap for this country to have made. Now, it took a long time to get there. I'm not I'm not trying to uh, paint this as as overly optimistic. It took a long time to get there, but the speed with which this happened with over the course of the last 15 or 20 years, and yeah. certainly over the last five years, to me is an astonishing change in our society. When you couple that with the Me Too movement, which has happened in the past five years, as well now as the elevation of the Black Lives Matter movement, and we'll, uh, I'll come back to that in terms of Juneteenth in a minute, you have these uh, three enormous social transformations that have really happened in a very, very short space of time in the country. And so I'm not being uh, you know, overly optimistic and, and thinking that this is you know, rainbows and unicorns here, but we've seen an extraordinary change in the in no, I think that that's something a... very fundamental in this country in a very short period of time. And that doesn't have anything to do with what might happen in this election and where we are going. Um, history really doesn't do that kind of predict- predicting job all the time. But I'm, I'm astonished as a historian, as somebody who's watched how slowly things often happen, to see the stunning speed with which we've had these remarkable transformations of three things, homosexuality, the role of women in, in the workplace in particular, gender, when it comes gender to the equity. Me Too movement, yeah. gender equity, and then the elevation of Black Lives Matter oh. to a fringe movement a few years ago yep. to something that has now been adopted and picked up by all of corporate America, which, by the way, is is often a better bellwether of where the country is moving than what politicians. That's a really good point. Yeah, yeah. And I'm so glad that you connected all three of these kind of social movements, LGBT, equality, gender equity. And and those words do mean different things, as well as obviously the Black Lives Matter movement, which is simply the continuation of the civil rights movement. These are all human rights. These are all civil rights movements. But but, you know, if you look back as a historian, was there ever a change on social behavior or public opinion on on these types of ideas? I mean, maybe going I'm, I'm thinking of maybe interracial marriage or integration of schools and so on. I, I, I'm not the historian here, but it does seem like these things over the past few years have, have, have taken big leaps. I'm not sure exactly how to phrase it because you're doing such a careful job at saying it didn't happen overnight and, and, and millions of people fought for these rights and many died for them. And so we don't want to forget their efforts and their lives that they committed to this, but it does seem like public opinion, especially on black lives matter. And I've seen the polling has changed dramatically within the last three years. And we can talk about why, but where in history do we have anything 
that we could measure changing as quickly, given all the caveats that you and I have already inserted? You know, I'm going to go back to that year of 1968, Pete, that I, I mentioned already. And I, I, as a, <laughs> as an older white man, I want to be somewhat careful here. I go back to 1968 because James Brown released a record that year called Say It Loud, I'm Bra- Black I'm a- and I'm Proud. And we were all singing it. You know, it was it was a fundamental cultural landmark. And of course, that was the same year that Dr. King is murdered. So I I don't want to oversimplify these things. But certainly around that moment, because we had had the riots in 1967, 1968 uh, in Watts, Detroit, uh, Mount Vernon, New York, where I grow up, uh, Newark, and then the Kerner Commission comes out with this report that says we are moving towards an, uh, a, a country in which there are two nations, one white, one black, separate and unequal. That was a famous, famous report that was issued about the unrest in the inner cities of America in those uh, long, hot summers of more than now, more than 50 years ago. By the way, the Kerner Commission identified 12 deeply held grievances in the the African-American community. Number one was police practices. Is that right? That is absolutely right. And if you go down the list of the other 12, they are all equally still as pertinent and meaningful. So in 50 years, you know, a lot has changed and nothing has changed. And that's uh, important to keep in mind because that's why the suddenness of this stunning change about attitudes towards the police, like a complete turnabout in public opinion about what is happening with the police and what the police should be doing, uh, is to me what, one more aspect of this astonishing transformation uh, in our society. Um, so I, that's why I think it's it's a pretty remarkable moment, and probably 25 years from now, historians may look back at this and say, wow, something really happened all at once in America during this period. Um, I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that we are a younger and much more multicultural society today than we were 30 years ago sure. and certainly 50 years ago. Yeah. Uh, because I think a lot of the changes that we're talking about change with each generation, just as uh, my parents uh, probably had different attitudes about race and homosexuality than I did. And certainly than their parents would have each generation has certainly become uh, much more accepting of very, very fundamental changes. I believe in, in a very big picture sense. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so I think that that, that accounts certainly for some of it, that certainly accounted for the election of Barack Obama. Uh, he, Barack Obama was elected with the extraordinary turnout of young people of color in particular, but young people everywhere, people of color uh, voting in large numbers And uh, that was one of the reasons that that was such a transformative election in our history and why some people thought uh, incorrectly that we had reached an end of of racial politics in this country. Clearly, we have not. It's interesting, too, as we talk about these advances in in social justice or however you want to want to name it. You mentioned the election of uh, the first black man. Then we had the nomination of the first woman and she won by three million votes. But because of the Electoral College, of course, she didn't win. But it does almost kind of follow history where I'm just thinking about uh, the the, the right to vote, how uh, blacks got the right to vote, uh, but only men. Women could not. And we can talk about the history of the suffrage movement. And what I've learned recently was that even within the women, there were uh, there was a racial divide. Uh, in terms of rights, which was fascinating, I didn't know about. But it is it is interesting to note that the black guy gets elected and the woman doesn't. And I don't know if there's much more to say about that or how much we should read into it. And the electoral college is the problem. She did get three million more votes than the white guy, uh, and I think that matters. I think that's probably the best way of looking at it in terms of progress, maybe. 
Look, progress is, you know, it's very, very slow when you're in the midst of it. And as a person of considerable privilege, I'm again trying to, to walk carefully here um, because I'm, I'm trying to look at it in the, in the broad, broadest sense of the word of what pro- it's, it's dreadfully slow to go back to your original question about how th- quickly things change. Um, interracial marriage was only made legal by the Supreme Court in the 1960s in the uh, case, which is very pertinent later on for same-sex marriage, because called Loving v. Virginia. And even though that Supreme Court decision erased the laws against so-called miscegenation, interracial marriage, uh, I think the social attitudes lasted a lot longer. Um, certainly, you know, growing up uh, in the 60s and into the 70s, even in a progressive or fairly progressive place like New York, uh, the environs of New York City, um, interracial marriage was still a, a, a rare thing. Um, now it's, you know, utterly uh, uh, commonplace, accepted. No one thinks twice about it, I would uh, say, for the most part. But it, t- it took, you know, a long time. I think time. you're wrong about that. I think uh, what, I, I think what? I think that there's a lot of communities and families in America that not only don't like their their kids, you know, uh, marrying people of color, white families especially, uh, but don't even want them dating. Uh, you know, I mean, I I, I think we, I'm only pushing back on no one would think twice about it. I feel like there's still a lot of communities where you know it's it's not accepted or acceptable or frowned upon. Point taken, I would say that uh, the, the, the vast majority of Americans would have no problem with at this point with uh, with interracial dating yeah. marriage, whereas not long ago, the vast majority would have been opposed to it. Right. So I would say that the tables have turned on that. For but, sure. And it's and, and again, it's it's not it's not done with. It's not over. Um, so I, th- I think it is it, it does go back to this point that I made earlier that generationally the country is changing and and it will take uh, a, a degree of time. Look, I've been following, for instance, this Confederate flag, Confederate statue controversy for a very, very long time. Yes, yes. Uh, until fairly recently, it was not considered even possible to get rid of these statues. And now all of a sudden, every day we see another one being pulled down, defaced, head head chopped off. Um, And again, it's the the suddenness with which that happened. It's not as though people haven't been complaining about it for a long time, but many more people are now sitting up and paying attention and saying, yeah, yeah, that's right. What? Why do we have that statue? While it's um, a big achievement, it still feels to me like it's the least we can do is take down statues to traitorous, racist people. And 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 by the way, it's it, it's still difficult to take down these statues. Some of them are even being guarded by these certain people. And and uh, what's what's even more challenging is to rename a school, a park, a street or a military base. But it seems like we're going to see. That as well now. I think Mitch McConnell said he's okay with it, and and that's bizarre. You know, that's the Senate Majority Leader. So, uh, I I just think that it's um, a long time coming, but it also feels like it's the least we can do. I don't want to minimize it, but it still seems like sometimes. Well, you know, once we get rid of these statues, there'll be racial equity. No, I, I I'm not uh, I'm not a uh, I'm not a dreamer in that in right. that sense. I know you're not of, saying of, that at all. I'm saying just out loud to other people. This but, is the least but, we can do. But in a very short space of time, what went from being a point that no one would even consider sure has now become largely the majority opinion. So that you have the Pentagon actually had signed on to the name uh, the name changes of the 10 uh, Confederate bases. Are there 10 the of Pentagon, them? Yes, there are 10 of them. Uh, there are 10 of, military I'm, bases in the United States of America named after Confederates. That's correct. Jeepers creepers. That's an uh, understatement. With, that's starting phrase, with Fort creepers. Lee, Fort Hood, uh, Fort Beauregard, uh, Fort Bragg. I mean, you can go Fort Polk. You can go down the list. Yes, these are all bases named after Confederate generals, Confederate leaders 
Uh, these are, of course, men who broke their oath of office. Most of them were Union Army officers. So they broke an oath of office they had taken to defend the country and the Constitution and then uh, then actually became traitorous and led troops against Americans and killed a large number of them. So uh, these bases, of course, were named largely named in the 1940s. Uh, they were largely named when uh, Southern Democratic congressmen uh, still hold, held sway, uh, were the most powerful members of the, uh, the Democratic Congress in many ways, the solid South of the 1960s. And this was clearly uh, one more way to assert uh, white supremacy and to assert that the South indeed had lost the war, but they were going to write the history. Uh, so that's, I didn't realize that's, they were named in, in the 40s. But I mean, we, I learned this from you years ago, basically, and a lot, a lot of other people have learned as well. But you've always written and talked about how the Confederate flag really only became popular as a result or a reaction to the civil rights movement. And so basically, every time black folks would gain ground or would be making an effort to gain ground, the reaction, especially in the South, would be to do things like rename these bases or there would there would be a, a, a reaction which which adopt uh, the confederate the stars and bars as the state flag put up these that the two main statue building eras uh in the south of these confederate statues were in the 1920s uh again a period hmm. of tremendous reaction uh reactionism the tremendous spread of the ku klux klan in the 1920s lynchings were very widespread as a result of pressing back on the economic and political gains that uh, African Americans were making in that period after World War I. The next big uh, uh, period of statue building came in the 1940s and 50s, uh, again, in reaction to the growing civil rights movement. So this was uh, a way to literally plant my flag, to literally put up a statue that says, this is who we are. We are the people who honor the men who fought to defend the cornerstone of the Confederacy. What was the cornerstone of the Confederacy? White supremacy, the supremacy of white people over blacks and the, uh, the, the need to continue to allow slavery, not only where it existed, but to continue taking it further west. And that was the reason there was a civil war. Um, so these are really, you know, deep, hard questions that we haven't taken time to look, and we certainly don't teach them very well. So most people are really shocked when they learn about some of these things. They say, well, they never taught me that in school, or somebody parrots this states' rights argument that they heard somebody say in high school or college without ever exploring what ex exactly did that mean. We killed 2% of the population over something called states' rights. Uh, this amorphous idea. Well, there was only one right that counted in, in 1860, uh, and that was the right to continue owning uh, people and continuing uh, taking enslavement further west into the enormous territory that was being opened in the 19th century in America. And of course, every one of those new states that would come in as a slave state would get two more votes in the Senate, and at least one more vote in the House of Representatives and three more electoral votes. So this was political power. Right. And, and people still don't understand that very fundamental idea that slavery was really baked into the Constitution and it gave the slaveholding states enormous political power that lasted for centuries. Uh, so speaking of uh, that power lasting, Jeff Sessions, the former Republican senator from Alabama, the former attorney general, uh, the first senator to come out and endorse Donald Trump. And he was Donald Trump's attorney general. And then people probably know what happened after that. And Trump dumped him. And now he is running again for his old Senate seat. And he's in a tough primary election, which is happening in the middle of July. What I wanted to ask you, though, is that in a string of tweets, Jeff Sessions uh, basically defended these Confederate statues. And what he said was, and he said that uh, 
We are seeking to erase Alabama and America's history and thousands of Alabamians uh, for doing what they considered to be their duty at the time. Naming the military bases after Confederate soldiers, Sessions said, quote, was seen as an act of respect and reconciliation toward those who were called to duty by the states. It was not then and is not now an affirmation of slavery. Uh, his opponent and uh, the, the, the guy who's got the seat, uh, Senator Jones, the Democrat, uh, responded by telling Jeff Sessions to delete his account. And it makes sense because to to defend those statues the way that he did and to try to thread that needle is is pretty horrific. Uh, how would you respond to what Jeff Sessions defense of the statues? This is the kind of simplistic heritage, not hate argument that, you know, is this nice slogan that got thrown out uh, for a long time. Oh, we're de- we're those statues are there to celebrate our southern heritage. Well, that heritage is inherently and inextricably linked to the fact that these men were fighting to defend the status quo in those Confederate states, which meant slavery. So if you read the secession documents, as we've talked about many times over the years, and they're long and boring, but right there in South Carolina, in Georgia, in Florida, in Texas, you can go down quite a list of them. It's very explicit. It's not hidden. It's explicit that they are there because they want to de- uh, defend slavery, which is then explained as the rightful place of the white race over the black race. So you can twist all you want about what these men did and how heroic they were, but they were heroic in defense of a crime against humanity and white supremacy. And there's no two ways, for me at least, to look at it objectively and see it as anything other than that. Um, So I'm sure that people feel some nostalgia for this, you know, kind of gone with the wind romanticism about uh, about the the slave holding self. But that's what it is. It's romanticism. It was a brutal system of terror in which women were raped routinely. Their children were then enslaved because they were born uh, to, uh, to an enslaved woman, and they could be sold at great profit wherever their owner, who was sometimes their father, wanted to sell them. Uh. So if you want to say that that's the system that these men fought for, then you have to say what that system really was. You mentioned Texas. Let's go to Texas and back in uh... – 1865, you wrote a piece four years ago for the New York Times opinion section titled Juneteenth is for everyone five years ago. And the truth is the president of the United States and his campaign advisor in 2020 still didn't know or don't know the history of this date and of this holiday and this celebration, really. So a lot of Americans don't know about it. You've been writing about it. And let's go to Texas in in 1865, where just a couple months after General Robert E. Lee surrendered, what happened? Okay, June 17th, 1865. The Civil War is over now for more than two months. But uh, Texas, of course, is far, far away from Virginia. Uh, And it took a long time for Union troops to finally get there. Uh, 1,800 Union soldiers, U.S. Army soldiers, led by a New York general named Gordon Granger, land in Galveston, Texas. Uh, They included a large number of U.S. colored troops, which was the name they used during the Civil War, the the official name for African-Americans who had enlisted and were serving in in the Union armies. Uh, Two days after he arrives, General Granger stands on the balcony of a building in Galveston, Texas, and basically tells everyone who's gathered beneath him, an audience that is mixed race, that based on a decision by the executive, Abraham Lincoln, all slaves are free. People couldn't believe their ears. Now, how come they didn't know in Texas 
1865 that the Emancipation Proclamation had been announced in 1863. Right. Well, it's very simple that the, the slaveholders of Texas were not about to tell the enslaved people of Texas that they were free. And uh, that that's as simple as that. Most of them were certainly illiterate. Did some of them know? Certainly. But here was somebody coming in to this state with troops, victorious troops, the Confederacy was done, it had surrendered, telling 250,000 enslaved Texan African Americans that from that moment, they were free. They threw their hats in the air, they started screaming for joy, they called it the scatter because some of them just flat out left right away. Others remained, they were willing to stay as wage workers, a Freedmen's Bureau was set up in Texas to guarantee that the uh, that was a, a federal government agency that was set up to uh, guarantee the rights of uh, emancipated uh, African Americans after the war. The Freedmen's Bureau was there. They were going to become uh, wage workers. In some cases, they became uh, uh, farmers who was another form of servitude, actually. The um, farmers who were, you know, working on the land and then had to turn over whatever they produced to the to the owner as rent. Um, that was a different system. But within one year of this announcement, on June 19th, 1865, a celebration began spontaneously, and it was called Juneteenth, just taking those words June and 19th and putting them together in what linguists like to call a portmanteau. Um, <laughs> Is that right? <laughs> uh, that's when two words are put together. It's Never heard portmanteau. of that, but that's a fun that's, fact. Okay. Okay. Well, now you, uh, now you can uh, talk I about I will never be able to get away with using that. Uh, it okay. just, I just won't be, given my reputation. Okay. So Juneteenth. So, so Juneteenth becomes a spontaneous day of liberation, celebration, it is Independence Day to these people. You know, a few years earlier, before this, Frederick Douglass had given a very famous speech uh, in Rochester, New York, and the, the president at the time, Millard Fillmore, was actually in the audience, and uh, they expected Frederick Douglass to give a nice patriotic Fourth of July speech, and he says, what to the slave is the Fourth of July? It, uh, we are not free. It, it just reveals what a, a, a horrible country this really is. Um, this was an astonishing speech for him to have made at the time, but that's who Frederick Douglass was. So to most African-Americans, the 4th of July didn't mean life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and all men are created equal. It was just one more day that they were enslaved. Mm -hmm. Juneteenth becomes the day they are emancipated, and that's why I call it the other Independence Day, and that's why I also believe it is for everyone, because I believe... If you truly honor the notions that we celebrate in the Declaration of Independence, that all men are created equal, that we are all entitled to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, those ideals are not realized until emancipation comes. So I think that this is a, a, a great day for all Americans to recognize the fulfillment of the dream of July 4th, 1776. It takes until June 19th, 1865, for it to come true. And of course, as a result of the folks celebrating, uh, there was still a violent resistance, uh, right? I mean, even you write in this article, any small gains came in the face of whips and guns, followed by the well-documented decades of Jim Crow laws and Klan terror. Officially neglected over time, Juneteenth lost much of its resonance in the black community, and that was so disheartening to read. But uh, from what I've uh, other things yeah, I've read, you know, yeah. it, because it wasn't officially supported by any state, certainly no former Confederate state was going to honor a holiday that celebrated emancipation. Uh, and in fact, the white supremacist governments in most of these uh, states after you know, Reconstruction was was killed in, in 1876, uh, they they were going to suppress anything that looked like black political organization, black social building. 
so a holiday that celebrated the end of white supremacy was not going to be tolerated, and it was really suppressed. It really existed almost exclusively in black churches, and it did have a kind of gospel churchy feeling to it. I've read a lot uh, uh, over the recent years of people who talked about growing up in Texas, which really held on to this tradition much more so than any other state. It was born there, and it really did uh, hold on there because it became a social thing. It went to from being a church service and singing and picnics to barbecue, uh, the traditional red soda, as they called it. Uh, they would have was that carbonated, and, the red yes. soda? Yeah, how did they? Was, car- do you know how they carbonated soda in the 1860s? Um, you're getting beyond my, uh, because my when I read your op-ed and you mentioned that your writing is always so well, visceral and I, I just, I love your writing and, well, so, and you wrote, so, you wrote, so they were celebrated, uh, barbecue was soon added to mix this with uh, this being Texas with strawberry flavored red soda water to wash it down. And I just, yeah, I no, love that image number one, but I was like, where did, how do they carbonate the soda? Well, I, I don't know if they, uh, you know, I don't know the history of soda. And now I'm going to have to investigate maybe it. Wasn't, it. But maybe I mean, it just, how old is Coke? You know, they, there was carbonation uh, I don't you know, know. quite a while ago. So we, we can we can leave that to another episode of. It's the uh, most important detail uh, oh, here is but I promise the history of carbonation. Uh, the next time I come to talk to you, we'll we'll talk about carbonation. Look, Historian David, you know. and carbonation uh, expert, Ken C. Davis. So, yeah, that's, you know, these I, are important things. Well, I think it's so, important that. Well, I'm sorry. Did I interrupt you? Did you want to finish a point? Sorry. Yes. Let me let me just finish on the, that that point. A, a separate from the red soda, but you know there were foods that were very specific to Juneteenth, and the New York Times has written about that uh, even recently about how to celebrate Juneteenth, um, but. As people moved around the former Confederacy, this did travel with them. And then in the Great Migration, which wasn't until later in the uh, early 20th century, uh, it was brought north. So places like Oakland and Detroit celebrated Juneteenth. Sometimes they called it Juneteenth Day, but still without any official recognition and always in the face of tremendous resistance, this was still Jim Crow America. I think that as the as the civil rights movement comes along, uh, people tended to really forget about this folk holiday to focus on the real work of getting the civil rights accomplishments as painful and slow as they all were. And it's really only uh, in the last, um, it's probably 30 years or so, that this folk tradition began to be uh, revived. And as more people learned about it, it's gained some national attention. And then, you know, I first wrote about it in 2011 for Smithsonian Magazine. And then I wrote about about it again in the New York Times in 2015, because it was the 150th anniversary of the first Juneteenth. And um, still, when I talked to people about it, it was it was a mystery to most people. and, And it remained so. Uh, and I think that it's only became obviously the, the president today took credit for it. What? And in a way, yes, the credit, the president today apparently made some statement in which he he decided that because of what he had done, that's why everybody knew about it. So he, he should be we should all be grateful to him. Um, Trump claims is, he made Juneteenth, quote, very famous. He, uh, in an interview with the Wall Street Journal, I did something good. I made Juneteenth very famous. Mm. So, um, thank well, he you. should make it a holiday. You know, that's what he could do. I, it's interesting to see the governor of Virginia now talking about making it a holiday. I mean, that's what uh, getting caught in blackface 20 years ago will do. You really overcompensate when it comes to uh, racial policymaking, uh, potentially. And and I, well, it's, uh, Governor Cuomo announced the same thing. Is that uh, right? Uh, two days ago as well. Oh, great. So well, is, that's I mean, yes. how important what does history tell us about the importance of naming holidays? Because the, the the history around the naming of Martin Luther King Day, which wasn't too long ago and who is on the wrong side of that is pretty upsetting. But but how important is it to celebrate, you know, a certain holiday 
in, in America, what di- you know, we can talk about the, the, the real importance is Supreme Court decisions and policy changes and law changes and so on. But I, I do think that there's got to be a lot of value in, in celebrating a certain person or not celebrating a certain person that we were talking about earlier. Absolutely. And this is why we'll go back to where I think where we started uh, earlier in the conversation, which is why we're at such a fulcrum moment in American history where this semi obscure holiday becomes part of the national conversation now and governors are all kind of piling on to make it a state holiday because of the moment that we are in. And that moment has been, uh, is a transformational moment for this country. Uh, Look, when they say we're going to rename Aunt Jemima, we are at a turning point moment. This is, uh, again, as I mentioned when we started talking, when corporate America yeah. starts to take the, these yeah. things up, it's a real indication because corporate America doesn't care who votes in, the, in a polling place or how many people go to vote. They care about who's buying their products, and they also care about who it will want to work for them. And so corporations are often a little bit, of, especially in recent times, a little bit ahead of the curve on some of these issues because, first of all, they want to keep their customer base happy. And second, they want to keep many of their employees happy. Um, so that's that's why it's always interesting to see corporations moving very often. Yeah, before. they are. Yeah, that's a really great, great point. And we saw that with the LGBT community. We've seen that. With the Me Too movement, I think you could argue we've seen it with gun rights and that certain companies, establishments are saying, you know, like even like Walmart, uh, who sells guns is saying, well, you can't come in with your gun. Yes, it's legal, unfortunately, in our state to carry a a gun in public, but you can't. But it's also legal for us to tell you you can't come in our establishment with a gun. And now, of course, uh, with what we're seeing with, as you mentioned, uh, what is the the name of the company, the parent company of of Aunt Jemima's, Mrs. Butterworth? That's a different one, isn't it? That's a different one. No, the the parent company is Quaker Oats. Their parent is Pepsi, I believe. Ah, There you go. Well, nonetheless, Pepsi makes Layers of layers of- Yeah, but that's a big, big, that's no small deal. It's no small thing in corporate America. Let me connect connect it back because you mentioned holidays. Mm -hmm. The Martin Luther King holiday was only finally passed- in the last holdout state, which I believe was Arizona, after the NFL said they were going to pull the Super Bowl from there. So once again, now the NFL has not covered itself in glory in the past few (laughs) years on these issues of race. Yeah. Uh, they are trying to make a big, big U-turn right now. Yeah, that's another great, uh, probably even better example of corporate change. The NFL has a lot more influence than Pepsi, arguably. Um. I, I think that, you know, the NFL's decision uh, uh, that was announced was uh, still a little half-hearted and somewhat mealy-mouthed, in, in my personal opinion, but, uh, but- because the, the commissioner's statement nowhere mentioned the, the, uh, the big personality who's right in the middle of it. You know, he doesn't mention Colin Kaepernick. Um, who was well, we could essentially talk- blackballed out of the NFL because he was uh, making a political stand that they did not like. So, But um, the history of athletes, you know, you, you mentioned uh, uh, corporate America, you know, leading the way at times uh, and obviously most of the time not. But uh, but athletes standing up for, in this case, racial injustice. But you can look at the, the women's soccer team and um, what's her name? Uh, Pino. Um, um, her name is escaping me. Uh, this great soccer player who was taking a knee a couple of years ago. So, you know, you can go back to Muhammad Ali and, and other athletes who have taken their platforms, their status, their fame as athletes and used it to create progress for whatever, whatever goal they want. And I think that that's a, also a really important change over history in, in this country or symbol. It's an important symbol when these athletes do this because they have a lot to lose. They do have a lot to lose. And Muhammad Ali may be the best example of that because he did lose a lot. Uh, And he was, I I know that uh, if you are of my uh, generation, when he was at 
his peak and he went from Cassius Clay to Muhammad Ali, he was truly one of the most hated men in the country. And he would be for a right. long time. Really took a long, long time for Muhammad Ali to get into the good graces of, uh, of white corporate America. Uh, he was not uh, the, the, the hero to many people that he emerged as later on uh, as same iconic could, figure. Same could be um, said he for was Martin. Truly a hated person in this country. And and people have kind of glazed over that whole yep. aspect. Uh, Megan Rapino is that soccer player. But the same could be said for uh Martin Luther King Jr. as well. I mean, right? I mean, you're seeing so many people right now com- compare this civil rights movement, Black Lives Matter, to the civil rights movement of the late sixties, led by Dr. King and many others. And uh, and that was not a perfect movement that had a lot of division within the movement that we've learned about. But most importantly, the point I wanted to make is that you you just said is about Muhammad Ali. Same about uh, Dr. King. He was hated. He was surveilled by the FBI. Tell me a little bit about how he was seen then versus now. I would say it's very, very similar in, in many respects. White Americans saw him as a threat. And so what was the great threat at that time? What will you name somebody who's a threat? Well, you find out and you start to tar him as a communist, which is what the uh, the, the FBI set out to do, J. Edgar Hoover in particular. Um, so no, Martin Luther King uh, was not the heroic, beloved character that we fondly think of him as today and every politician would of course you know dutifully go out on martin luther king day and and talk about how they have a dream too but you know that was not how he was seen and the big turning point for dr king uh he had been closely allied with with lyndon johnson but then he came out against the war Hmm. When when Dr. King came out against the war in Vietnam specifically, um, he was really uh, it, it was a, a major blow to the public perception of him, at least in in white uh, traditional white America power uh, uh, power corridors of America. So no, we we always you know gloss these things over. And then, of course, in assassination, he was elevated uh, to much more of the beloved figure uh, that, that he is seen as today, well, but certainly not in his time. I, th- um, I think it's also important just to mention, because what we, we're, the Black Lives Matter movement is is right now, I think it's probably fair to say that it's 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 easily connected and identified as a, a movement uh, to try to change the way that black folks are treated by law enforcement. It's an anti-police brutality, police murder movement, and people can describe it in different ways. But truly, if we were to expand the conversation, and when you do it, we're talking really about systemic racism. And in certain, you know, law enforcement's defense, they're asked to be doing too much uh, for certain communities. And we need to ba- basically fund those communities and provide opportunity, education, and health care for those opportunities. And Dr. King was fighting for economic justice and I think people really never learned or they've conveniently forgotten about that. And I think if you ask Black Lives Matter movement uh, folks and leaders and, and, and you look deep into it, they, too, are fighting for that kind of economic justice. And we can talk about anything from reparations to universal pre-K. W- w- what do you say about what Dr. King was fighting for and, and compare it to the economic opportunities and justice that black folks are fighting for today and their allies. I have been, I, uh, it's a great point. Thank you, Pete. I've been talking about this for a long time that most people, when they think of Dr. King and, you know, focus on the racial progress made because of the civil rights movement and his profound leadership in it. But when he was Getting ready for the next march on Washington in the spring of 1968, it wasn't just a racial march. It was a ra- uh, it was a march that had three legs of the stool. I think that he may have used that term himself. Um, certainly, civil rights, economic justice, poverty, which he thought transcended color in America at the time, which it did, and finally. Nonviolence, which meant an end to the war, pacifism. 
those three things were in his mind, three things that went together and couldn't be separated. And that's what he was working towards in the last uh, years of his life and certainly in preparing for in the last months of his life. Uh, so that's, a, again, a piece of the story that kind of gets glazed over as we look back and we want and to I talk think, about the, the I have a dream speech. And a subset uh, of, of trying to gain economic progress, of course, I think a lot of us believe is the strength of organized labor and the ability to bargain. And he was killed while supporting uh, a union, if I'm not mistaken. He was in Memphis to support the sanitation workers, a largely African-American uh, civil uh, civil servants union. Mm-hmm. So, yes, union rights were uh, uh, integral to what his belief was. And I'm going to now bring this to the Black Lives Matter because you and your mention of, um, you know, the pro- police piece of this, which again, go back 1968, Kerner Commission, number one grievance, police practices, but then go down the rest of the list. One of the things that has happened because the epidemic, and that's why I say you can't separate this moment as Black Lives Matter moment without talking about the pandemic moment, they've been completely linked together, at least in my mind. This uh, this pandemic completely exposed the inequities in the medical care system in this country. I don't. I won't call it healthcare system because we don't have healthcare. We have a medical care system. A medical. Uh, system that doesn't really focus much on health care. And we have seen, of course, people of color dying in numbers grossly out of proportion to their numbers of the population, reflecting some of the in, innate justices in, uh, injustices in, in the system. And so this, the pandemic has blown the lid off. Just as the pandemic was responsible, I believe, for the tremendous amount of shared frustration and shared anxiety that people in this country felt when they saw that horrific murder scene in Minneapolis. And it was finally just too much for everyone. Um, But I I think it, it does certainly come out of this sense that the pandemic has really pulled the bandage off this deep, deep wound and and shown us how pervasive it is in so many ways in our system, education system. We talk about schools shutting down. Well, guess what? All the rich kids have computers to go home to. And this has been a huge setback and for poor communities. Food to eat. And and, and, and activities so go, down the, go down the list, yeah. go down the list. Opportunity, we, opportunity, opportunity. So so the pandemic and Black Lives Matter um, have, I think, exposed the deep, deep problems we have, which are problems that go back to 400 years. And we can never separate what slavery meant to this country and what it continues to mean to this country. And that's when I, when I t- t- talked about people, talk to people about history, and I've been doing it for 30 years now. Um, I say you, can, you can't understand the present without understanding the past. And it's not this simplistic, oh, the past repeats itself. But everything that happens today comes out of what happened before. And that's why we need to understand this 400-year history that did not end 152 years ago when the Civil War ended. If you liked my conversation with the professor today, don't know much.com, get all of his books and pre order his book coming out on October 6th Strong Man, The Rise of Five Dictators and the Fall of Democracy. I cannot thank you enough for another, wow, hour of your time. I really appreciate you teaching us and joining me in conversation. And I, um, I, I got to say, I sometimes feel smart when I'm talking to you, when I when I'm able to set you up to make another point about history. I felt like that happened today. It makes me feel good about me. I feel good about well, me when I get done talking to you. Well, I'm, I'm glad I made you feel good about you, Pete. It's, but it's all I, because I I've see. learned so much from your work. 
Look, I think these are really important conversations and, yeah. we, you know, we've covered an awful lot of territory here today and, you know, I, I hope it's shed more light than heat, um, which is something I always hope to do. Um, and it's, again, it's a fascinating time. Uh, it doesn't always feel like we can enjoy the fact that it's fascinating when we're going through this, uh, both the rigors of what it means personally to to go through this confinement, isolation as a New Yorker, and to be witnessing these profound, profound changes that are so long overdue uh, in in racial consciousness in this country. So yeah. it is a profound moment in our history, and we should watch and look at it very carefully and be very thoughtful about it. Pay close attention to what is happening right now. Well said, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you, Pete. Take care. We'll do it again. I hope so. We'll do. We got to do it again before uh, maybe the fourth, and we'll talk about the conventions and, and a lot of other things. All right, pal. What happened? Did he say goodbye? I'm not sure. Did he said. I know he said goodbye. I don't know. Did I? Did I cut it out somehow? Can't see Davis. Love it. Always appreciate it. All right, that's it. That's all I got for you today for episode 130. Thank you very much, Christian Finnegan. Thank you, Can't See Davis. Let me know who you want to hear next week on the show. You can email me, stand up with Pete at gmail.com. Send me a, mes- a message if you're a subscriber on Patreon. And if you are a subscriber, I hope to see you tonight at 8 p.m. We're going to have a great conversation about how you're dealing with the pandemic, the economy, the politics, and anything else that you want to discuss. I've talked to a few of you this week. I had great conversations with Karen Madison and Michael Azevedo and Zach Lewis. And who else did I talk to? Subscribers. I was hanging out with Dan McDonald, who's a friend of mine and neighbor who just hired my daughter to watch his kids a few hours a, a day so he can get some work done, which is great. I love the listeners of this show. I love to hear from you. I love to talk to you. I love to get to know you. Thank you to all of the new subscribers this week. And I hope to see you tonight at 8 p.m. on the video link. Bring your favorite drink, your favorite story, and we'll have a great conversation. If you don't want to talk, if you're shy and you just want to hang out with us and watch, I promise not to embarrass you. We're happy just to have you there. See you tonight. Go to patreon.com slash Pete Dominic to sign up if you haven't already. And hope to see you at 8 Eastern tonight. I cannot promise I'll be completely sober, by the way, but that'll be that much more fun. I kid. I'll be fine. But by the end of it, I might be in the bag. I love you. You're not alone. Talk to you tonight, hopefully, and if not, next week right here on Stand Up.